All right, ME Thermo, ME 3210 Thermo 1 class. Uh, this is the lecture for November 19th. And uh, put the schedule up just to see where we are. So this is, we are starting chapter 10 today. And we have three more uh, lectures in chapter 10, which leads us up to the final exam after Thanksgiving. So the semester is rapidly drawing to a close here. All right. Okay, so we'll skip the learning outcomes. You can look over those on your own if you want to. Okay. So uh, we're going to start out here with the vapor compression refrigeration cycle. And this is kind of the standard uh, refrigeration cycle used for, I guess, refrigeration or air conditioning uh, in the country and probably around the world. Um, we can see there are four principal control volumes. We have a con condenser. Well, it's, I guess we'll start with a compressor, condenser, expansion valve, and evaporator. And we'll go through those in some detail here. All right, so there's the evaporator. And this is where the uh, cooling effect occurs. If uh, this is an air conditioning system in your house, then uh, return air, room air is blown across a coil that has cold refrigerant. Uh, in there, and as the heat's transferred from the uh, warm air to the refrigerant, the refrigerant boils off. It's mostly a uh, liquid when it enters that evaporator, a cold liquid. And we complete the phase change as the refrigerant flows through the coil. We have at least uh, saturated or superheated vapor coming out because it's going into the compressor and the compressor doesn't like any uh, liquid droplets. And so that's the next component. We have to put work in in order to compress this uh, refrigerant vapor uh, from low pressure to high pressure. So oh, oh, wait, excuse me, uh, it comes out as a fairly high temperature, high pressure um, uh, gas, superheated um, refrigerant vapor out of the compressor and then it goes into the condenser where guess what it condenses and we blow some sort of a cooling medium a lot of times it's just outside air uh, and we dump the heat to the environment that gas coming out of the uh, compressor uh, refrigerant vapor is probably on the order of at least 150 to 200 degrees and so even when it's warm outside, 95 or 100, that still looks pretty cool compared to 150 to 200. And so we can transfer heat uh, to that warm outside air. Um, and the last component is the expansion valve, which is basically a throttling process where uh, the high pressure uh, liquid that has condensed in the condenser drops pressure uh, a little bit of it uh, flashes uh, to the vapor state. Uh, most of it stays liquid, and that drop in pressure uh, drops the temperature significantly, um, probably into the low, the low 30s. We can't get to 32 or we'd start freezing things. So in the uh, uh, mid to upper 30s, and then from there we go back into the evaporator coil and uh, that two-phase mixture again mostly liquid but some vapor then uh, <clears throat> gets boiled away or evaporated in the evaporator. So all energy transfers by work and heat are taken as positive in the direction of the arrows on the schematic and energy balances uh, and are written accordingly. So whatever direction it's shown going is considered positive. Okay, so process one to two, I'm sorry, process four to one. I can't read numbers tonight. Uh, we have two phase uh, liquid vapor 
a mixture of refrigerant is evaporated through heat transfer from the refrigerated space. So this could be going on in your refrigerator. It could be actually could be a freezing compartment on a deep freeze, or it could just be the air conditioning system in your house. But so we're two phase, like I said, mostly liquid going in and we can see the little ball run through there as it gets evaporated and we're all at least saturated, most likely slightly superheated to protect the compressor uh, at state one. Then uh, state one to two, refrigerant uh, vapor is compressed to a relatively high temperature and uh, pressure requiring work input. So we got to put, uh, we got probably an electric motor turning the compressor. We're putting work into it. And there we see the little blue ball go through the compressor. Excuse me. And then we get to uh, uh, process two to three, where the uh, vapor or refrigerant vapor condenses to a liquid through heat transfer to the cooler surroundings. And again, because we have significant temperature in that uh, superheated gas uh, coming out of the compressor, then even when it's really hot outside, we can still transfer that heat uh, to the warm outside air. So we go through the condenser and then uh, we have liquid refrigerant uh, is going to go from three to four through this expansion device. There's different types of them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but basically uh, it's just a throttling process. And uh, so we have a, a significant pressure reduction from uh, three to four. And the working fluid gets, gets significantly colder as we do that. So let's look at the engineering model that we'll use. Each component is analyzed as a control volume at steady state. So nothing changes with time. Dry compression is assumed. Uh, the refrigerant is a vapor. That means that it's all vapor. Uh, as it goes through the compression process. We're not putting any liquid droplets in on the suction side of the compressor. Compressor operates adiabatically. No heat transfer from it. There's a little bit, but pretty insignificant in the big scheme of things as far as the energy transfers. Uh, the refrigerant expanding through the valve undergoes a throttling process, which is constant enthalpy. You know, that's our simplest of... Uh, uh, processes. And we're going to ignore kinetic and potential energy changes <clears throat> throughout the cycle, which is uh, pretty common. Right. Applying uh, mass and energy rate balances to the evaporator. Wow, my goodness. So we get the, uh, uh, that's the refrigeration effect Q dot N, and that means that heat is going into the refrigerant uh, per unit mass is just the enthalpy difference, H1 minus H4. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's pretty easy. Uh, the term Q dot N is referred to as the refrigeration capacity expressed in KW in the SI unit system or BTUs per hour in the English system or tons they don't mention that here, but we also will refer to refrigeration capacity in terms of tons. And a ton is defined as 12,000 uh, BTUs per hour is one ton of cooling effect. And that would be into the evaporator. Ah, there we go. Uh, a common alternate unit is the ton of refrigeration, which is uh, 200 BTUs a minute or 12,000 BTUs an hour, which multiply by 60, uh, or about 211 kilojoules per minute uh, in the SI system. Okay, uh, the compressor we're going to assume is uh, adiabatic. 
for the compression process. And so the um, compressor, the rate of compressor uh, requiring the energy per unit mass is just the enthalpy difference, H2. And of course, that's positive because there's more enthalpy, more energy coming out than goes in in terms of the refrigerant flow. And then we have the condenser. So Q dot out, it would be H2 minus H3. And of course, H2 is more energetic than H3. So we write the inlet minus the outlet to make that a positive term. And the expansion valve, assuming a throttling process, is H3 minus H4. So the enthalpy is the same. So, you know, when we write the, the first law uh, across all of these different uh, four components, we just get the enthalpy differences, except for the expansion valve where the enthalpy is constant. It's pretty simple, not bad. Okay, so coefficient of performance, we know that's the, it's like an efficiency but it's greater than one for a refrigeration cycle. So we kind of changed the, the name of it. So for the refrigeration cycle, we use beta and that's the, uh, uh, the desired uh, effect, which is the evaporator heat transfer. And we're showing it per unit mass divided by the costly input, which would be the compressor work uh, rate of work input to the compressor per unit mass. And then we can plug in uh, our enthalpy definitions and we just get H1 minus H4 divided by H2 minus H1. Okay. Uh, and so for a Cardo sock, we know it will have the maximum theoretical possible coefficient of performance. And so we put a beta max, and that's defined in terms of the temperatures, Tc uh, minus, excuse me, Tc divided by Th minus Tc, where Tc is the, uh, the uh, temperature of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> The uh, cold sink that we're trying to maintain and TH is the temperature that we're rejecting the heat to. Sorry, had a brain freeze there for a minute. Okay, this equation represents the maximum theoretical coefficient performance of any refrigeration cycle operating between cold and hot regions. This is a little more concise way to say it, uh, TC and TH respectively. Okay, so um, features of the actual vapor compression cycle. So heat transfers between a refrigerant and cold and warm regions are not reversible. Well, because there you got to have a finite temperature difference in order to have a reasonably sized heat exchanger. So they're not going to be in reality. They're not uh, reversible. Okay. Uh, refrigerant temperature in the evaporator is less than Tc. That's the uh, Tc be the cold, uh, the temperature of the cold region we're trying to maintain could be inside the refrigerator, could be inside your house, whatever. But so, you know, to not have an infinitely large heat exchanger, we have to get colder than that uh, in order to be able to uh, transfer the heat and maintain the temperature in that region. So we're going to show that across the, that would be the uh, refrigerant temperature. And then the refrigerant temperature in the condenser uh, is greater than the environmental temperature. It has to be uh, in order to, again, have a finite heat exchanger. And so as we go from there to there. <clears throat> okay, irreversible heat transfers have uh, ne a negative uh, effect on performance. So the larger that temperature difference, the more entropy is generated and the more it hurts performance. 
Okay, the COP decreases primarily due to increasing com uh, compressor work input as the temperature of the refrigerant passing through the evaporator is reduced relative to the cold region. Okay. And so the COP decreases because we have to do more compressor work uh, the colder that we want to make the refrigerant. But on the other side of things, the colder the refrigerant relative to the cold region, the smaller the heat exchanger can be. And so that could reduce the first cost of the unit. So you can have a trade-off between first cost of buying the thing and the operating cost long-term for the energy input. Uh, the temperature of refrigerant passing through the condenser is increased relative to the temperature of the warm region. So uh, both of those effects are going to uh, decrease the COP, which is basically the efficiency. But again, you can downsize heat exchangers. <laughs> So there's a give and a take here. Okay, that shows that uh, refrigerant temperature going up. So then that would mean you were compressing to a higher pressure. Or certainly a higher temperature. Okay, uh, irreversibilities during the compression process are suggested by uh, the dashed line from state one to state two. So this would be the compression process. So as you see, if we had an isentropic compression, we would go straight up. However, now we're going to that same pressure, um, but with a real compressor, we're going to have an entropy increase, which is going to take us further up. And so we'll have greater temperature coming out of the compressor. And again, that hurts our coefficient of performance. Uh, an increase in specific entropy accompanies an adiabatic uh, irreversible compression process. The work input for compression uh, process one to two is greater than for the counterpart isentropic compression process. Yeah, certainly, because uh, remember the, the, uh, the specific work is the difference in enthalpy, and we're starting at the same point. But 2S is at a lower temperature than two, and so the enthalpy difference from one to two is less than the enthalpy difference I'm sorry, from one to two S is less than the difference from one to two. And so that's going to hurt your uh, efficiency. There we go. Looking at the two compression processes. Uh, since process one to four, and thus the refrigeration capacity is the same for cycles one, two, three, four, one, and one, two S, three, four, one cycle, one, two, three, four has a lower COP. So uh, we have the same uh, capacity, but we have to put more work in the real cycle. And so that's going to hurt the COP. And you can see the uh, Refrigeration capacity is from four to one. And so there it's identically the same. So that tells you you have the same capacity. Your condenser has to reject more heat in the real cycle as compared to the ideal compression cycle. Okay, the isentropic uh, compressor efficiency is the ratio of the minimum theoretical work input to the actual work input uh, each per unit mass flowing and so we recall this is the comparison of an ideal compressor with a real compressor and so we see the 
isentropic is going to require less work. So it goes on top. The real one goes in the denominator. And uh, so the isentropic uh, compressor uh, is H2S uh, minus H1, and the real is H2 minus H1. When you're working a problem, oftentimes this number is given to you. You can find the H2S from knowing the entropy and the pressure, and then you can use this expression to solve for H2. So on the top, again, work required uh, in an isentropic uh, compression from compressor inlet state to the exit pressure. And that's uh, that straight vertical line from one to two S. And then the work required in an actual compression from compressor inlet state to exit pressure. And that's this process where we have an increase in entropy from here over to here, from there over to there. That kind of quantifies the, irre the internal irre irreversibility. Okay, so uh, let's look at an actual vapor compression cycle. Uh, we have an example. So the table provides steady state operating data for a vapor compre compression refrigeration cycle using R134A as working fluid. And you have these tables uh, in your book. Uh, for a refrigerant mass flow rate of 0.08 kilograms per second, determine the compressor power in kW, the refrigeration capacity in tons, the coefficient performance, and the isentropic compressor efficiency. So and again, very nice in some of these. Uh, he gives us all of the enthalpies and that saves uh, a lot of work. And we see the uh, cycle diagram uh, over here. So one to two is the compressor, the real compressor. One to two S is the ideal compressor. Uh, two to three is the uh, condenser or two S to three. And three to four is the expansion valve. That's a line of constant enthalpy. And then four to one is the uh, evaporator effect where we boil off the refrigerant, the refrigerant by transferring heat into it from the uh, whatever space we want to uh, keep cool. Okay, so again, we show our properties in the cycle. And so the total, the absolute amount of compressor work, rate of doing compressor work or power is the mass flow rate times the enthalpy difference from one to two. And so we're just plugging our numbers in. We got 0.08 kilograms a second uh, at two up here. We're 280.15 minus at one, uh, 241.35. Excuse me, uh, it's kilojoules per kilogram. And so we get a kilojoule a second, and, but that's the same thing as a kW. And so we get 3.1 kW is the rate of uh, work input uh, into the compressor. Refrigeration capacity, the uh, total amount is Q dot N is the mass flow rate times H1 minus H4. So that would be from here to here. And we see. And so we plug the numbers in. Uh, mass flow rate and enthalpies. Uh, and so he's going to convert this. This is going to come out. Uh, we, well, he, he wants to convert to tons. And so we've got seconds here. So we have to convert to minutes. Uh, and then uh, we'll get uh, kilojoules per minute and divide by 211 will convert to tons. And so we see 3.41 tons of refrigeration. That's coefficient of performance. 
beta. It's the cooling effect per unit mass, H1 minus H4, divided by the compressor work input, H2 minus H1. Plug it in the numbers, we get 3.86. So what that means is for every one unit of work input that we put into the compressor, we get 3.86 units of cooling out of the evaporator. Well, it's almost four to one. And in some cycles, you can get to five or six to one. Uh, if you have like a water source uh, system, uh, you get better heat transfer. And you, typically you get uh, better temperatures. And so you can get higher coefficients of performance. Uh, instead of doing the heat transfer to air, say in the condenser, if you have a, a water cooled condenser. Okay, the isentropic uh, compressor efficiency is uh, just our definition. The rate of work input to the compressor per unit mass divided, oh, of, of the uh, isentropic unit divided by the rate of work input per unit mass in the real unit. And so that's H2S minus H1 divided by H2 minus H1. Putting in the numbers, we get uh, 0.8 or 80%. So the isentropic efficiency of this compressor is 80%. Okay, we can look on a uh, pressure enthalpy or Moyet diagram. Um, is it's a common diagram that gets used in uh, the refrigeration uh, industry. And so we see, so here we have pressure and enthalpy. And so we see from the, uh, the low pressure coming out of the evaporator. Uh, and these are lines of constant uh, entropy. And so you see for the isotropic compression, we stay on this line of constant entropy up to the high pressure. And so we follow that line. Uh, for the real cycle, we have an increase in entropy. And so we have to bend off uh, to a uh, higher entropy value at that same pressure. And we, so that shows graphically that this enthalpy is gonna be greater than the isentropic exit enthalpy. Uh, and then we see the uh, uh, condenser. So the real cycle has to condense from two to three. And so we are then uh, a little bit subcooled liquid. And then we expand at uh, constant enthalpy. Pressure drops at constant enthalpy with the expansion valve. And then we go into the evaporator where we boil off that refrigerant and slightly superheat it and come back to the compressor. So that's pretty common. Okay, uh, selecting refrigerants. Refrigerant selection is based on several factors. Performance provides adequate cooling capacity, uh, cost effectively. So, you know, it's too expensive. Because, you know, there's a theory out there that says ultimately just about all refrigerants wind up leaking to the atmosphere. Because you buy a refrigeration system, they fill it full of refrigerant, and you never buy any more unless it leaks out. And so, you know, the, the fact that every two, after they get four or five years old, every couple of years, you have to have the service people come and fill them back up. And they're not completely empty, but they've leaked. And so after they get older, they all pretty much leak. And so at the end of the useful life, when you replace it, they do pump the refrigerant out. So that much doesn't get leaked, but anything else that got put in uh, leaked to the environment. Safety uh, avoids hazards, toxicity. Some of these things, if, if you had a big refrigerant dump and you were forced to breathe it, uh, might possible ammonia. Ammonia is a great refrigerant. Ammonia will kill you. So uh, some of these things are toxic. Uh, environmental impact minimizes harm to stratospheric ozone layer and reduces negative impact to global climate change. Um, you know, you can use CO2 as a refrigerant. It's actually not a bad refrigerant. And uh, 
some people are more and more uh, thinking about using CO2 uh, because it, the global warming potential is much less for CO2. It's just one. Whereas some of the uh, uh, refrigerants, it could be 20, 30, 40 times uh, the global warming potential as regular CO2. Uh, here's some characteristics and here's the global warming potential. So you see, uh, and carbon dioxide is refrigerant 744. So it has its own number. Uh, ammonia uh, has no global warming potential, but it will kill you. <laughs> so you gotta think twice about that. Propane, three. Methane, the main constituent of natural gas, uh, 28. And what's this, butane? How much experience with butane, but it's three. But you look at some of these, say R12 has been uh, phased out. And the reason it was phased out was because of the global warming potential. Uh, 10,200 compared to one for CO2. R11, uh, R134A, well, it's still not very good compared to CO2, but it's a whole lot better than R12. So you can see the uh, various uh, refrigerants. I'd say uh, 134A is pretty common. Uh, 12 and 22 are being phased out. Um, and some of these get used in larger chillers and stuff like that. Uh, GWP, global warming potential, is a simplified index that estimates the potential future influence on global warming associated with different gases when released to the atmosphere. And so the base gas that's assigned a unit of one is carbon dioxide. And then they're all ranked relative to that. Uh, let's see, what well, the footnotes say? Global warming potential depends on the time uh, period over which the potential influence on global warming is estimated. The values listed are based on a 100 year time period, which is an interval favored by some regulators. Source Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. How about that? Okay, um, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, and hydrochlorofluorocarbons, that's a mouthful, uh, are early synthetic refrigerants, each containing chlorine. Because of the adverse effect of chlorine in the Earth's stratospheric ozone layer, uh, use of these refrigerants is regulated by international agreement, and basically, they, uh, you can't, I don't know if you can buy R22, you can't buy R12. You can buy it on eBay for about five, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars a pound, but uh, I'm not sure about R22. Uh, hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, and HFC blends are chlorine free refrigerants. Blends combine two or more uh, HFCs. Uh, while these chlorine free refrigerants do not contribute to ozone depletion, with the exception of R123YF, they have high global warming potentials. So they're not favored either. Natural refrigerants are non-synthetic, naturally occurring substances which serve as refrigerants. These include carbon dioxide, ammonia, and hydrocarbons. These refrigerants feature low global warming potential. Still concerns been raised over the toxic toxicity of ammonia and the safety of hydrocarbons, yeah, like they blow up. Because, <laughs> I mean, methane is basically natural gas. So you got to be all careful with that. Uh, okay, uh, absorption refrigeration, I think we're going to stop there. Uh, this is a, actually a fairly short chapter, so we'll get through it pretty quickly. Uh, I will be uh, sending you some uh, homework problems here shortly. I have not selected those as yet, so I'll try to get those out to you uh, in the morning. I'll probably go ahead and send this link uh, this evening to the lecture. So I hope you guys have a great night, and I'll be back in touch soon.